case, uh, it kind of brings me to a question here. So if the team itself had a natural disposition to more passive, to more passivity, passivity, uh, screw it, uh, <laughs> to more passive play, yeah. uh, but you often had like, uh, like the Nidalee picks, you had these more like aggro picks, kind of like Renekton itself is it's like in its nature a very aggro pick. Do you think that the passive nature would not be as detrimental had you been drafting more counter like disengagey comps that like punished engages more like if we had uh more picks that were like the Orin Braum style mm -hmm. and then just uh like other surrounding pieces that could like punish engages better do you think yeah. that would have just naturally melded like better with the team yeah i think yes and no i think there were scrims in which we did play like that and it went pretty well and i think naturally the style the team had is a lot more slow um but i think for whatever reason team fight still sometimes we struggled with um mm -hmm. and i think part of that was just a lack of knowing when to go in and where um and i think because the meta was so low engage and so much range mm -hmm. I it's, mean, you're thinking Victor, you're thinking Corky, yeah. Jinx, Jin, all of these high range champs, of course. They're very high skill ceiling comps, and if you mess up once, you're going to get wiped. Yeah. Um, and I think that while our playstyle was more passive, I don't think we were good enough at like those individual picks to warrant playing comps like that. Um, and I think sometimes you need to pick comps that kind of unfortunately band-aid your mistakes when you don't have that much time to work on it like we oh, had yeah. I mean, you know just playing to your strengths. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so i think it's, yeah it's like 100 I, thieves look like they're their chickens with their heads cut off when they try to pick like corky because they don't know how to play scale and comps it's like you have to play to how yeah. your team knows how to play so i think we could have played those types of comps but i think also we ran into similar issues when fights would happen because um we would mis-execute um, yeah, so it wasn't necessarily the matter of the team not being an aggro based team but there was just sometimes like lapses in knowledge of where opportunities arose and when to take them yeah and i think if you're drafting something that is more aggressive that has more engage you can mess up and then you just snap engaged and then you win like the next mm -hmm. fight um it's a lot it's a lot more um forgiving if you make a mistake yeah. Mm-hmm. That's all good. Uh, let's see what I have up here. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, this is something we haven't talked about yet. Um, when you go over stuff with your players, what role do VOD reviews or, like, looking over past games take, and how do you utilize those as a way to improve, if at all? Yeah, so I think ideally, um, one in between scrims, like, we'll go over, like, short clips between games. Um, I wish it was longer, but I think like the the collegiate meta in scrims at this level is very different than like well, amateur. I'm every team feels different, like completely different style. There's no like. Yeah, cohesion. well, it's interesting because when you get to higher levels of play, the reviews between games get quite long. Um, mm -hmm. Like we had a, a period with Taco Gaming in which I think we reviewed for over 30 minutes after game one. So we played game one, and we have we sat and watched for thirty minutes, and so did the like the other team was doing it too. It's not like either team was saying, "Oh, can we play now?" Like both teams are really? are just reviewing this long. Um, do you think you get like value out of that for that duration? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, with collegiate and for teams like not super at that level or like aren't at mm -hmm. like academy LCS type levels, because academy and LCS teams also tend to have super long reviews in between games. Mm -hmm. But we, um, but we know from like people like Bjergsen where there are people that just think of these as useless in that if the the people guiding these review sessions aren't like in uh, intelligent enough about what's going on that it's not actually going to benefit at all and that it's a lot on the 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 way that these reviews go over where you can actually get value from them because I believe it's yeah. also a big shift is that Bjergsen went from hating VOD reviews as a player but then on TSM constantly using them with his team because he had to explain things. Yeah, and I think the way that you organize and format it is what's important. Um, I think a lot of teams do fall into the pitfall of like, we review every single mistake in the game in between each game. 
which I don't like. Oh. Um, to me, so they should be you, focused on something. Do you focus on like game losing things? Do you focus on like things that are easier to improve? Or like, how do you, what do you choose to focus on? It should be what the week's focus is. So every week we would go in and say, this is what we're working on in scrims this week. Oh, we are cool. working on our objective setup. We are working on not dying in sides. We are working on our uh, like wave control early so we don't die to like a level three gank or something. Yeah, um, 320 gank or whatever be it. Yeah, and every day before scrims, I would remind them of the goals. Well, I would kind of ask them because they're college students and they forget. So I will say who <laughs> like remembers what it is. Um, <laughs> That's too funny. And then after scrims, we'll check in again and see like how did we feel about that. Um, and when we feel like we've improved on it and it's consistent, I typically want to have consistency for at least two scrims. Um, once we're consistent, then we will move on to another thing. Um, but I will also have a list of like, these are things we have to work on and we'll kind of order it on what we think is most important. So reviews should be centered around those things and everything around that. I will take note of, but I will not focus on in VOD reviews. Um, I think if you're at a higher level, you can focus on it, um, but I think giving players like four or five things to focus on in a game is too much. It's too mm -hmm. much information, it's too much to focus on. Um, I think also, we didn't get a chance to implement this this year, um, but in previous years we've had things like individual staff check-ins in which we're working on like individual goals of the players, um, and that's Are there like different. any positional coaches, or is it just like kind of all like a head coach and assistant coach? Um, coach. It, we've had some like players help out, uh, but no one officially in like positional coach roles. Um, mm -hmm. like, we've had challenger players come in and like do one v ones and just like teach and help teach some of the players some things. Um, but typically, we would have like a sheet of like these are the goals that we're working on individually for the players, mm -hmm. um, and it was like very collaborative with the players. Um, but to go back with the vod review stuff, it's yeah, you have vod reviews in the day where I review the stuff in between games. And then um, ideally once a week or like once every other week, we have a VOD review of like a series or um, I adopted this this year where I would do a VOD review and I would just post it. And I would say, just watch it by this time. <laughs> um, How or do you think I'll... that worked out? Do you think uh, it's like as effective or just like effective in terms of the fact that it's something that you can do easier? It's more time efficient, yeah. <laughs> um, that's for sure. Um, especially around like exam time. And that's been the hardest thing to juggle, I think. At, at a school like UCLA, that one is mm -hmm. hard and two has a quarter system. It's just yes. constant exams. Um, <laughs> so it's much easier on both me and the players just to have me do something and say, just watch it by then. And as long as you watch it, it's fine. But it's definitely a lot less interactive and I don't think it's as conducive for learning. Um, and then we'll throw in like pro VOD reviews if there's like a, a really good example of something that I want to do um, or like have presentations on different concepts and stuff. That's really interesting. So you kind of, uh, you really go in as like a teaching kind of position where yeah. it's, uh, it's not just about like looking at your team and like micromanaging them, but also kind of like trying to expand their horizons and introduce mm -hmm. some new ways of thinking and so on. Yeah. It's... I think it's a lot more effective to be like s deliberately practicing. And I think league players especially have a tendency to just like grind out games and that's not super effective. Um, like, I, yeah, so, I, uh, you can finish your thing now yeah. and then hop on that statement. So I, um, something I tell the players is that I hit GM in Starcraft and I think I peaked at like, I don't know, like 25 or something. I played maybe, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I played maybe like <laughs> maybe five to 10 games a week, mm -hmm. which is incredibly low in StarCraft. StarCraft, mm -hmm. you can grind out like 20 to 30 games a day. Yeah, especially um, in a, as a 1v1 game, if you're just that much yeah. better, or if you play more uh, aggro. Uh, like, And they're much shorter. The games are much yeah. shorter. Um, but I would be very deliberate about my practice. So I would watch a game, review it, take notes, go into the next game and work on something. And I hit GM much faster than I think I would have if I had just grinded out stuff. Um, 
so being deliberate about what we practice in scrims and then also attempting to teach them to do that in solo queue but yeah that's a re it's a really hard habit to break of just like mm -hmm. queuing up for solo queue yeah, just kind of like uh, blind playing without like a yeah. goal in mind. So th it just reminded me of um, b before, after Bjergsen was like leaving TSM and before he kind of joined TL, he was playing a lot of solo queue to kind of get back into the way of things. Not that he wasn't playing that much as a coach, but one thing in particular is that when he was streaming, he would use a program that automatically like records the game mm -hmm. and reviews. he reviews it between every game. And of course, it's easier to do so when you're in masters plus where the game queues are like 20 minutes each so yeah. you have quite the amount of time between games um so do you like encourage your players to get like uh softwares like this that like have uh recordings that show them like that they can use between games um i know there's popular apps blitz gg mobilitics uh, a lot of these things that have uh kind of like uh medals or accolades based on games say you performed very well in vision score it'll say good job or mm -hmm. you did the opposite you bought zero control words etc it would tell you these kinds of things do you like encourage these more so solo queue oriented like third party programs meant for improvement to your players i have never specifically recommended one of those apps because i um i think sometimes they may not highlight the right thing yeah um and i think it is they are they tend to be catered more so for lower elo i think it, it can be really helpful I mean, for lower elo players for sure for sure it's really hard like for an app to identify errors at like a master's plus level um mm -hmm. aside from like you bought this many control words you know what i mean um yeah. but even then it's solo queue and do you really want to be buying like 10 control words if you're like an adc probably not um but what I do recommend is like if they have something that records the games, that's fine. Or also you just use like the in client replay stuff and that works too. The only issue with that is I think after it patches you can't access those replays anymore. Um, and that's if it doesn't bug out in the current patch. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can never I if I want to use replays I have to use something else to record. Yeah, so either or, um but it again it's been really difficult to like I can't force them to do that. I'm just saying it would be a lot more helpful for their practice if they just take it a bit slower and learn. Um, but sometimes they just like grinding out games and that's fine too. Yeah, because it can be for fun too. It yeah, yeah, yeah. To always be competitive. Uh, do you think uh, when you try to tell them to like play in such a way that they can grow from, do you encourage things like trying new champs or do you try to like have them hone in what they're already like going to end up playing? Um, I think it depends on like the players' goals and the goals for the year. So if we talk as a team and like we really want to do well competitively, we want to win, then I will recommend like these are the champions that I think we should work on um, or improve on. Um, mm -hmm. Like if they play really good champions already, but they're kind of messing up in some things, and I'll I'll say that. Um, if it's also prep for a certain week, and I say this opponent plays these champions practice 1v1s in prep for that so have picks ready for those things um and i kind of leave it up to them and then we'll see what fits in I'll, I'll give my recommendation of like i think these are the best picks here um but i'll give them a list of like this is what i expect them to play what do you have into it and then we'll go practice 1v1s or something well i guess on that note do you ever do um not like necessarily like full out practice drafts with your players, but in that case, it sounds a lot like you say, okay, say this is what you're up against. What do you do? Is that like something you commonly do with your players? Like trying to yeah. make sure that they always have an answer to every situation? Um, I started doing that a bit more this year. I wouldn't say it's like a counter to every situation, but more so like a counter to certain expected picks. And I think it only really works in the first couple of picks in draft anyway. Um, in prior years, I did try to really raft out and predict things and that was really bad for me i'm really not good at drafting like that um i'm a lot better at drafting on the fly and as long as the players can play picks into what they're going to play that's all that matters and then i can build the comp around that um and we really can't do that also until the later weeks of a tournament because there's just not enough data on the teams exactly uh, that makes a lot of sense yeah let me just see what else here so um i guess 
we went over this a bit, but this is the last point I have written down, I think. And it's, um, we never went over this, but when you look at players, uh, do you find like map, like control, uh, especially like coming from RTS, this is probably really big for you. Uh, do you find like map control F key usage as something that's like kind of like a much more impressive feat out of a player? Like if they're able to always have their map in the right spot or they're aware of what's going on elsewhere during whatever they're doing right now. Is that something you try to see or is that just, that could also just not be something we see in CLO. Like what's what's the map awareness yeah. in CLO? F key usage is incredibly rare in general in League. I don't think I've ever seen a player use it that I've coached. Um, I think it would benefit the most from roles like jungle or support. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm surprised. Uh, I feel like uh, like better junglers would be using it. Yeah, I like, think a lot of them like just junglers. click the mini map. You know, um, <laughs> it, I don't think I'm it's. I'm pretty in... sure that's what Dom did. Yeah, like I, when he played. <laughs> I don't think it's like indicative of like you know they're better. I think it, it's probably a good habit to have. Um, mm -hmm. And I think overall, I think the map awareness in general is slightly lower in league players than mm -hmm. like RTS players. Um, but that's because you have four other pairs of eyes to look at the map and um, you don't have to look at it constantly because you're not, you can like mess up and somebody else can see it. Um, yeah. And I think also that's a skill that can be worked on. Um, mm -hmm. Like in the past we've done like metronome stuff. So you have a met like, you have like a metronome playing and every time it hit, it, it ticks, you look at the mini map. Um, Oh wow, I like so, that. That's a really clever idea. Yeah. I don't know how uh <laughs> how good it is, but some of the players like it, some of them don't, because it can be a little distracting. Um yeah. but building like good habits like that is is useful. Um But I mean map awareness in general is good, but F key usage it's not I, it's I haven't not... seen enough of it to know. Okay. Interesting. I I, I definitely would have expected especially with your like an amateur as well that you would see a bit more but i guess it's just that not popular <laughs> yeah it's not really super popular <laughs> it's way too fun. Yeah. i find that actually very funny to me um i had something on the tip of my tongue oh uh, yes yeah, uh about comms um when it comes to comms you just like mentioned how it's like less important that you know everything yourself in a game like league versus an rts where you're the only one really looking mm -hmm. around um do you think that this kind of like reliance not necessarily like full reliance but kind of like you're relying on that your team might be able to back you up in the event you miss something is something that could hurt i know there's a lot of like deferring opinions around what comms should look like there are, of course those that are saying that comms should be constantly active constant stream of communication of what's going on and then there are others like ls who believe that comms should be generally silent except for like sums in like specific team fight angles because yeah. people are supposed to be able to know themselves what's going on yeah i think um another coach has said that too it was the um griffin's coach i can't his mm -hmm. um name is eluding me right now um <laughs> But him and LS have the similar view of, like, ideal should be quiet. Um, mm -hmm. I think sure in a perfect world, yeah, and you can all be on the same page at the same time, like, yeah, that's great, but that's not realistic. Um, at the pro level, that is a bit more realistic. At collegiate level, no, there's no way they're ever going to yeah. be able to do that. Um, I think my view of comms, I have adopted um, Daylor's model and he has like a blog post from years ago the old fanatic <laughs> coach um the huni rainover fanatic coach um mm -hmm. his post i think is great on comms and how to like divide up roles where it's the main role of comms is you want to divide up tasks so that the amount of strain on like your brain is lessened um that's an interesting thing i actually like that so it's like even if every single player can has the knowledge to say something it should be assigned to only one so that it becomes like muscle memory for that one player to say like tp timer or something or um to call out engages so now it, it also helps with like competing interests like if you have two people calling yeah. different things that won't happen if people are calling specific things 
Yeah. Um, and I think he divides up like the major shot calling roles from like main shot caller, secondary, communication, link, and like cheerleader. Um, cheerleader. What yeah. is that? Is that like after team fights? Like good job. Or like if someone <laughs> if someone's like tilting, like if it, if the team is tilting, having someone that is, that is like pretty positive that can keep mental up is important. Um, so like throwing a joke or something. Um, that is great. Yeah. Some of that like you don't need to have a cheerleader, but it helps. I, um, I don't know. I feel like that that helps. <laughs> I no, like I think it helps a, a lot. Great thing to have. Um, and when it comes to comms and being on the same page, I think um, as long as everyone has their role, they know what they're saying. It's also very difficult to implement this type of like to, to implement comms in general. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I want to try a bit different next year. Is like how to drill that in and how to get people comfortable with what they're saying. Um, but yeah, what was, I don't know if I answered the question though. So. Um, no, I just asked if uh, you thought more about like uh, constant comms versus like quiet comms, right? I mean, you answered perfectly yeah. with the whole like uh, role-based comms, which I actually hadn't really heard of before, which is surprising to me because I feel like that's actually when you're talking about like division of labor in the sense that you're going to have each player focus less on maybe macro things to the point where they could focus more on micro things that seems like actually a really good idea but yeah. i i usually don't hear that and i also don't see that very often like within teams to begin with i mean if you if you see like the voice comm teams i know uh like there are teams that usually uh that are struggling right now because um like for example g2 is like there's no clear shot calling no clear like macro decision maker mm -hmm. right now even though it's literally a team of veterans plus like flock at darkness um when you're talking about those kinds of teams that are like you'd expect that people would know when to talk but they don't it really shows that maybe something along the lines of uh setting up communications in such a way that each person has a responsibility might actually like help solve those issues yeah and that actually really insightful yeah like i don't i don't know like how a lot of pro teams are doing their comms i've only had like the opportunity to listen to a couple in my experience um but i think something that i've noticed at like challenger plus level scrims or comms in general is that it tends to be the game knowledge is great and they're all feeding really good information um and i think when you have like specific roles it guides things a lot more because otherwise they see every opportunity they see every chance to get something mm -hmm. and then it, that's where i can get kind of fiesta -y. um yeah. <laughs> and i think it doesn't need to be constant comms you just need to be aware of where you're going so mm -hmm. i really emphasize the direction yeah so i emphasize like for main shot caller if that's the person like kevin for example that is giving direction for the team there also needs to be someone that is reminding the team of the win condition and that changes per game and that's up to like coaching staff to say like these are our win conditions and then in in game that player will say oh we don't have to do anything here because our win condition is this um mm -hmm. and i think like for example like if you want to go like think of like an ls type draft his win conditions a lot of times tend to be like they have the better um overall like scale and comp and if they just sit back and don't do anything they'll just yeah. auto win um yeah he's definitely known for the give first two drakes give the rift heralds minimize damages and then third drake your team's online you got that one yeah. two item usually two item power spike if you're talking about what he's looking for uh and then by that time you're supposed to like win the fight even though you've not picked a single objective yet yeah so theoretically with comms like as long as the team knows that and they're aware of that and they play to that you can be pretty quiet like as long mm -hmm. as you're just reacting and, and doing what you need to do on the map um but i think a lot of teams are really bad at implementing good communication systems um Definitely. I mean, yeah. uh, that was yeah. one thing that we saw. I, don't, I mean, of course, I say we saw, but um, I don't know if you've actually seen it, but uh, the TSM uh, uh, mic checks. Mm. Uh, this was, I mean, of course, TSM has been a mess all over this year um, with uh, the issues with Shenyi, the issues with Kaido, and then the issues with Peter Zhang. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just been all over the place. But um, just their comms in general are actually kind of atrocious, where they're just screaming and they're like saying whole sentences without getting to the point and those are like the kind of things you usually want to like remove from like cluttered comms yeah it's also really difficult when you have different like main languages that people speak um mm -hmm. it is really hard to implement comms um 
I think when Champions Q first came up, um, I think it was Supernova's mid laner um, who put out a tweet saying something like he's learned really simple, straight to the point, singular words are the most impactful in comms. Of course. Because at the high level, you should understand what that means. Um, and it declutters comps. And something also that I hate that I still see pro players do is like they just scream out one target 50 times, like to emphasize it more in a team fight or something. Or like here. Yeah, here yeah. Is like the worst thing. I hate when people say, go there, go there, go here, come here. Yeah, or, or like, um, <laughs> like if you, like for Valorant, if someone said here, that means nothing. Like it's really important in like an FPS game to know, mm -hmm. like you call out, like, oh, they're A short or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they don't know what that means. But in team fights, for the tendency, I think, I th it tends to be from what I've seen, like um, more veteran players will say like, like Calista, 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 like they just say it like ten times, and that's mm -hmm. something that I try to eliminate in comms is repetition, unnecessary repetition. Um, mm -hmm. I think players also tend to like to repeat like, um, oh, I'm I'm backing here for whatever, and they'll say it again, and then they'll say it again. Maybe not necessarily like that thing, but players have a tendency of repeating statements. Um, so just repetitive comms are like one yeah. thing that you find are not the greatest. Yeah, and that can clutter comms. And I think it can also create like a symptom of like, you feel like you're being ignored, but it's also oh, you're repeating the same thing, point. you know? So yeah. Because it's not reasonable to expect like seven different instances to be, yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about that. And there are, I think, ways to like weave in and out like acknowledgement of certain comms. So it's like if someone says like, Oh, we're playing for Dragon, okay, I can push this wave and like TP. Someone mm -hmm. else should say, like, should respond and acknowledge that and then say what they're doing. Um in quickly and like efficiently yeah. in an ideal world, but it's hard to build patterns like that. Mm -hmm, of course, especially when most of these people like in CLOL are coming from very casual backgrounds to begin with. Like if, yeah. they're, if they're going to be playing ranked like duo or something, flex, whatever, be it, they're not going to be most likely comms the way you would want in a scrim game or yeah. a live match. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think that's actually everything I intended to go over. We did the, we got a lot of insight about the drafts, the players themselves. Um, I really like this kind of section we had on communication because I feel like that's uh, it's definitely a very important part of League that's not actually terribly emphasized. I think it's criticized more than it's like explored, which yeah. I'm very glad we got to like kind of go through the, uh, the methods that you can communicate within a game. It was also nice to get to know you and your position as a coach and how, unfortunately, you came a bit late this year, <laughs> but um, if... Uh, I'll keep casting. So um, you said the team uh, is going to be playing in a Rising Phoenix tournament? Uh, yeah, Phoenix tournament? Phoenix Rising League. Phoenix I think Rising. it. I think our first match will probably be either April 14th or 15th. Um, I think. Don't quote me on that. It's going to be around mm -hmm. like mid-April, though. Okay, so I wonder if we might cast those as well, even though it's not the right official league. Yeah. Um, but that would be something I would look forward to. Uh, get me very busy this quarter as I'd be doing the podcast and casting. Jeez, uh, I'm going to lose my voice pretty often. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it was really great uh, talking to you today. Do you have any like final remarks for TLG Talks? Um, no, I did. I'm really excited for next year, especially with like the updates to Seelaw. They seem really cool. Yeah, so uh, that was one thing I saw online. Uh, what do you think of getting rid of Swiss? I really like the new format. <laughs> I think the format is much better. Um, I still have some question marks about it, and I've been like in the discussion, like in the Discord with Tisa and stuff, mm -hmm. just asking him a bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> uh, like, I think if there's a way to create like a lower division that allows like higher ELO JV teams to play, that'd be great. But also, like, how well, do you? Aren't they saying you have two divisions, upper lower divisions, and yeah. then teams can have multiple? or schools can have multiple teams correct but um from what i could gather and i mean this is still unclear i think and maybe mm -hmm. when they release the rule set it'll be more specific but i was concerned about like what if you have a team like maryville that can field two or more challenger teams yeah you can't just put them in the lower division and be like have fun <laughs> like they're just gonna win you know yeah, so are you looking for like uh like a division that has like maybe caps or like maybe... yeah so from what Tiza said, it seems like um, the lower division um, 
you have to fall under the initial 32 that are placed, um, which would eliminate things like a second challenger team that could just get into a lower division. And mm -hmm. he was saying they're also looking at adding like a more competitive like JV type division in next year, not 2023, 2024. Um, but I think they want to see how this one goes. But I think this format is much better because we see our group right away. We know who we're playing. It lets us reschedule. Yeah, lets us reschedule, lets us prepare. Um, I think also it's supposed to be four groups of eight or yeah, four groups of eight with the top two making it out of each group. I think that's what it is. I might be wrong. Um, four groups of eight, top two getting out of the each so group into into like a playoffs bracket. Okay, so you'd have what eight in the playoffs? Yeah, I think so. That sounds good. And then, are I can't remember what they said about the divisions. Are the divisions still the same, or like conferences are? It should still be the same. Okay. Um, I wonder how it'll impact things like the West, though. That I think this year we only had thirty nine entries. Um, I think upper division will just become the top 32 teams then because I believe upper was supposed to be diamond average. Um, but there's no way that like the West can fill out 32 diamond average teams. Um, really? Is is the East more high elo than the West? East is considerably more competitive than the West. Um, the, do you think that's because of server location? Um, I don't or know. Schools? There's just a lot of schools it's... with scholarships yeah. in the East. Um, like yeah. in the West, I'd say there's maybe... 16 to 20 teams that could field like diamond average teams and there's yeah, so only know, maybe uh, 10 that are competitive i know like irvine is really strong um uh historically uh i can't remember where they placed they got second in... this year and second last year i believe yeah in the so west of course in the west yeah uh, what do they do overall i don't think they qualified because i think in so the you west you have to goes. i think the west is uh first place qualifies i think interesting um so i think this year and last year is asu it's very funny to me that the west is that much lower than the east <laughs> well i think like the east has um maryville winthrop um yeah. the team that beat winthrop which i can't remember what their name is um they have umish um and these are like teams that compete at the amateur level like they are significantly better and i think the only team that yeah like when you're thinking that you have you know niles on your collegiate team yeah the only team that has done that on the west is uci and then asu has some like supernova players on their team but mm -hmm. uci is the only collegiate team on the west that has played like as their entity on like in amateur tournaments to my knowledge interesting so that's just kind of like a weakness of the west is that less schools uh, less competitive uh of course you have to deal with the farther server that's uh that's not something i had uh kind of thought about before so that's also very interesting to see how next year's changes to the way uh CLO works will yeah. impact kind of that i think if western schools give like full rides like a lot of the eastern schools do then it'll even out but like even do the you scholars think it's more stigmatized in the west compared to the east like um, gaming, even though like the hub of gaming is here in LA. I don't know. Kind of like, I think there's a lot of like a, there's a lot of administrative stuff um, that goes into it, and I think um, when we think of like big teams in the West, they're also big team, the big school names in general. Yeah. Like it's Berkeley, it's like um, mm -hmm. ASU, UCI, like they're big branded school names. I mean UCI is mm -hmm. like a, a school that's come up more so in the past like decade or yeah. two um whereas on the east aside from esports i like you would never you would have never heard of maryville you know exactly you would have never heard of like a lot of these smaller teams and i, I think it's do, part do of you them know why that happened is it just because they decided to enter esports early and then that's how they got there yeah i don't know exactly why or how they did it but if i had to guess it's like a, it, it is a marketing thing like mm -hmm. esports is a is a field that they can get into and they can find success in and maryville has built up a very good program with good like support and they've done it pretty well um other schools have like tried to do it but they haven't done a, a great job of it um do you think it's easier with like smaller schools that, like around the east that were less heard of before to implement these things yeah and i think a lot of them also are private schools so they have more mm -hmm. flexibility um like 
it's difficult for UCLA to do it because it, it's a public school. Um, yeah. And also, like, you have to get into this school. <laughs> like, and it's a yeah. hard school to get into. Um, so there's a lot of administrative. So you have to be like, both talented in the game and in books. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping eventually, like, knock on wood, like, UCLA gives scholarships. That'd be great. That'd um, be great, yeah. Put some pressure on administration. I don't think they're going to care, but... Um, <laughs> I think like, it, who are you? in the Number, future, da, 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 da. that'd be great. And I think, I think it'll happen eventually. It's, it's going to take time mm. though. Yeah. I mean, esports is a, definitely a growing scene. Mm. Well, um, on that note, I'm glad we got to talk. We actually talked quite a bit today. I think we elapsed over an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, but yeah, that was awesome getting to talk to you, get to know about the team, hearing about all the comm stuff, your upcoming uh, hopes for the new setup from Riot Seelol. That's all great. So um, I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, this is TLG Talks on the Silly Esports YouTube channel, and we'll see you here next week. <laughs>